Good morning, wherever you are. Good evening, wherever, wherever you are. We are so happy to have you again with us tonight for this wonderful uh, event about the movie Leap. It is such an honor tonight to have such distinguished guests. So exciting to have with us again tonight, director, producer, Peter Hoson Chan, here to talk about his wonderful movie Leap and to moderate tonight's event. Well, how can anyone introduce such an icon, a legend of TV and cinema? Lucy Liu, producer, director, and actress, and an Asian World Film Festival honorary board member. She graced us with so many roles the past three decades that it is impossible to identify the small screen, not small anymore, by the way, or the silver screen without the presence of Lucy. Her grace, charm, beauty, and talent has always been an intricate part of our daily lives the past three decades. In, in conclusion, I would like to show my gratitude as always to Asia Society Southern California. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Peter. And the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, George. What a beautiful introduction. I'm so happy to be talking to Peter, who is now in Hong Kong, and I'm in New York. And Peter, I love the movie. Um, it's such a departure from other works that you've done. And I wanted to ask you, it was done in the 80s, one of my favorite eras. Um, where were you during that time in your life? And, and what about that movie uh, or that script made you decide to direct that movie? Uh, thank you, Lucy, for having me. And I'm, I'm glad that you started the whole thing off by talking about the 80s. And um, I was in Los Angeles in the early 80s and then in Hong Kong and also traveling all over the place working on different projects when I started off in the industry in the mid 80s. Uh, but to me, I think China in the 80s was what really brought me to this project uh, because Chinese, China in the 80s, mainland China in the 80s is kind of like the 60s for us, you know, uh, people living outside China. It's, it's like, it's a time of uh, change and it's a time that was filled with possibilities. It was the beginning of the economic reform and the open door policy, which is really the beginning of the new China today, as we know today. And uh, I've never set foot in China until 1993. And uh, all my friends in China kept telling me how beautiful that 80s was and um, you know people were reciting poetry in the street and uh, everything was possible and um, I always wanted to see it with my own eyes uh, other than reading books and documentaries and watching tv footages so to me making this movie is like a dream come true and um, uh, you know there's this weird um, thing that happened to me was I, I was never a sports fan, you know, uh, least of all volleyball fan, but I did watch Lang Ping played her debut international game in Thailand, Bangkok, where I was growing up in 1978 in the Asian game. Wow. And that was one, one of the first international tournament for the Chinese women's volleyball team and certainly the first for Lang Ping. And I was like 16 watching them on ringside. I was a high school student. And, um, and, you know, 40 years later, I'm making a movie about her. You know, it's like, that's the magic of making movies. Did you feel that pressure because you had been there watching her play before of imbuing that kind of excitement and that energy? You know, it's, it's hard to recreate a, a, an actual volleyball game, you know, it, because it's, I mean, in baseball and football, you can almost you know, choreograph it, but the ball is not necessarily something that is gonna be as controllable, you know? Totally. So I, I noticed that you had discussed once before um, hiring sports camera operators. Um, tell me a little bit about that process because I'm guessing that you, you couldn't just shoot with one or two cameras during that time to capture that moment and that excitement. 
it's a process of learning. We shot three volleyball matches in the film. And the first match that we shot, we, I kind of like attempt using my conventional, you know, movie techniques by breaking up shots and trying to come up with shot lists. Uh, and it took, it took us like a week to do a five minute scene. Wow. And, and then, and then uh, with um, four cameras. And then on the second uh, go for, you know, on the second scene, we realized that that would not work. So we started employing more cameras. We had six cameras now, and then we just let them play. As you know, because I actually did uh, a tennis movie right before I started on this volleyball project. And in tennis, it's one against one. And it's, you know, you do it with a racket and then you could practice your move and everything and it looks great, you know. And then you could CGI the ball. But you can't with volleyball because there are six players on each side and everybody's got to be looking at the same direction, you know, where the ball is. So you can't really CGI the ball. You can't fake it. So, uh, and we ended up hiring real athletes to play, you know, the roles. So they were all really playing. And then we just let the ball fly all over the place and then try to capture it with six cameras. Wow. And it still wasn't quick enough. It still wasn't efficient enough, you know, with the six cameras. So when we did the final scene with the Brazilian uh, at the end, which is the ending, we hired six more cameras and they were all from the sports channels, you know, and they were all like really experienced, you know, photographers, cinematographers that actually did the real uh, games for their whole lives. And these people, they would come in and then they know exactly, they know kind of, they kind of know exactly where the ball is going to land because they're so experienced with volleyball. Wow. And uh, we shot with 12 cameras and we shot, a lot of footages and obviously the editor was on set but he can't can't keep track because we just kept playing and the players were exhausted and as you know the uh, ending scene with brazilian they were mostly the people that actually played the game before yes but it's impossible for them to reenact the game exactly point by point and shot by shot you know and uh what so what they ended up doing was they tried to start the game start to surf the ball as much as possible, identical to what really happened. And they try to end, hopefully end up with the same spot where they lost the point. And whatever happens in between, we're all up in the air, you know, they can't really control it. So we kept shooting and kept shooting. We shot like 13, 14 hours a day. And the national team players from the Chinese team, they were exhausted because they knew how difficult volleyball was for them, but it was like for two hours a day, three hours a day max. And they've never played volleyball for 12 hours, you know, nonstop. And that was uh, really difficult. And the most difficult part really was editing because you ended up with this tons of footages. Yes, yeah, like a documentary. How are you going to cut it all exactly. together? You almost have to write a script based on the actual footage that you have to make it happen. Exactly. And we were trying to match the game, uh, you know, as much as we can, uh, not identical, but as much as we can, because there were a lot of audience who actually would go up, go back home and put our movie versus the real game and oh try to find the similarity. No you pressure. Know, I've, got, I've got, I've got friends that actually did that, you know, and That's it was, uh, it was pretty, That's it was, I, I think, we, tough. We tough I know now. it was really tough. Yeah. Well, I was so impressed. And I, I mean, obviously, worst case scenario, you cut to the you know crowd watching. But I, I thought that you did a really fantastic job by building suspense, you know. Um, and I don't know that that's always easy when you know what the outcome is going to be because you imbued a lot of emotion within the characters and, and therefore in the game, you know. So there was a lot at stake and I mean, I've watched so many Chinese movies, so many Asian movies overall, and I, I've never really seen something that was just based on athleticism with that much emotion. And I, I was so proud of the movie because 
it brought those two things together and highlighted um, such a degree of, of, of love. And, you know, a lot of times in culturally, there's this very, you know, stern facade of, you know, being strong and, and being diligent and being intelligent, but not being emotional at the same time. And I thought you really brought so much poetry to that. Um, and it was just beautiful. So I, I wanted to know, how did you prepare these actors, athletes, when, you know, they were not somebody who may have had some history in, in, in film and knowing that they had to do take after take after take, you know, especially if it was emotional. You know, Lucy, that's the best part of uh, my experience in this movie is um, working with these athletes who are not professional actors. Mm -hmm. I've, I've actually never worked with uh, non-professional actors before all my life. You know, I've, I'm, I've always very, I was always intimidated um, in working with non-professional actors. And uh, I don't have an acting training ever. So it's really hard to talk about acting with actors unless they really know what to do, you know? Uh, my way of dealing with actors is to discuss with them as much as I can about the characters and try to dig the uh, inner self of the actors uh, in the past experience and try to match that to the, uh, to the movie, uh, to the mm -hmm. screenplay. And uh, this is the first time where I'm, I'm dealing with a bunch of people who have never acted before. And, uh, but I think two things came in really handy. One very important thing is uh, the fact that Chinese women's volleyball, it's such a big deal in China. And it's something that brings about the spirit of China uh, in the last 30, 40 years. Uh, it's all about uh, the reform and the opening door, op, open door policy of China, where China is trying to reconnect with the world, you know, after years of being a closed country. Mm -hmm. So to the Chinese people, there is an aura and there is a magic uh, towards that spirit. And whoever came on board, uh, be it actors, actress, uh, or, you know, uh, cinematographers, uh, production designers, they all came with a conviction. Mm -hmm. And that conviction is something that, uh, being someone from Hong Kong, it's really even hard for me to understand. So I've got a whole bunch of people who are really had this commitment and conviction to the project and to the era. And uh, at the same time, uh, when I'm working with all these athletes who are all either uh, wannabe national team players, you know, the players that played the players in the 80s, they were all people that are striving to become the best of themselves as an athlete uh, today. And all of a sudden, they're given a chance to play the national heroes in the 80s. And they all came with such convictions. Mm -hmm. And also the national team player, the present national team player who played the who play themselves, uh, you know, uh, the players in the present, uh, they were they all know about their experience and, and their victories, you know, and and their journey. So I've got a whole bunch of people who understand the characters a lot more than I do. And um, and when they're reenacting their life experience or their aspirations, there's a certain convictions there that, that is almost impossible for an actress uh, to, to act or fake, you know? And uh, at a certain point, I was even worried for, you know, for the actors, the professional actors that I have, like uh, all these Chinese movie legends like Gong Li or Huang yes. Bo, to be able to match uh, to the authenticity of these real people, you know? <laughs> so it was the other way around. So I'm worried about the, the professionals instead of worrying about the amateurs, you know? Well, they did a beautiful job. I don't think you had to worry about that in the end, but um, you know, there's a, there's a certain innocence and youth that you were able to capture uh, in those athletes. 
Uh, let me just ask you a question. Were those athletes all volleyball players or were they just athletic and then you taught them volleyball? Like, how did that work? They're all volleyball players. Let me tell you a funny story. I mean, when I started off, um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. You know, we had like 18 months of pre-production and uh, we were out there casting left, right, and center. You know, we were trying to uh, get some taller actresses, you know, actresses that are 5'11". You know, there are a few, not a lot, but there are a few. Or models, you know, that would be able to fill in the roles of the players. And then at the same time, you know, as a backup plan, we also were, we went all over China looking for real athletes, you know, from provincial teams and university teams and try to try to see, you know, is it easier for the actresses to learn volleyball or is it easier for volleyball players to learn acting, you know, and then we put them in two separate camps. And certainly as, as the result can tell you, it took a lot less effort. I mean, it's easier to train volleyball players to act than for actors to train volleyball because you could never get them in the same shape and in that, you know, to learn volleyball and to get them in the same same phys physique, you know, in the physical shape, it's impossible, you know, in 18 months. I mean, so I it felt like in every frame that you had, it was so, um, there was not a frame that didn't have some sort of physical activity and it wasn't just physical activity, it was intense physical training. Uh, so yeah, I can see why I think you made the right decision. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so let me just ask you about the the technical aspect of of what they did in the eighties with choosing how to win and defeat the other team. Is that something that was in the script originally? I mean, did you have to work on the script a lot before you shot it? I mean, eighteen months of pre-production is a long time. You know, obviously there was a lot uh, that went into it, but tell me a little bit about, you know, how much went into, because really when you have a script that is right, it, it makes everything so much, you know, run so smoothly. And a lot of times, and I've been in productions where the script wasn't right, but then you went ahead anyway, and then it was just, you know, bumps and hiccups and delays and, and confusion on the set. Well, as you know, the script is never right until editing. Uh, you know, you always would try to do better and better and better. And then you try to, you know, it's a, it's a process of evolution, you know, no matter what. But we did have a very good, um, I think, uh, first draft, actually, that actually, you know, a lot of stuff were decided, you know, mm -hmm. the uh, spirit of the, you know, the team in the 80s, you know, is very different from the spirit of the team today. You know, so we that was very certain that we want that that kind of brutal training, uh, collectivism, uh, you, you know, whatnot you may call it, or the spirit of the Chinese people and the Chinese women's volleyball to try to make the the best they could, you know, in the eighties. I mean, the training was brutal. You remember it was brutal. seeing- I, I felt like what you did in that, I don't mean to interrupt, but it sort of emulated, the training sort of emulated the, the nationalistic spirit of China. And then yeah. when it seemed like when she came back and Lan Ping came back and, and coached, which yeah. is, you know, I wanna to talk to you more about that, but that the spirit of the modern era was not as vigorous or as engaged. And was that something that you were trying to imbue in, you know, for the audience or to say, you know, what is that, what is that yes. spirit that you feel is lost? It, it was very intentional. It's definitely intentional because you can't make a movie where the first half and the sec second half is exactly the same, you know, because you've gone through such brutal training in the first half and we got to give the people the reason that we're going through that brutal training. First of all, China was poor. Uh, and China was very much behind in terms of technology and resources. And the only way that you could make yourself seen by the world is by working harder, you know. Uh, and you remember the scene where the old coach, 
uh, decided after he was told that the American team started using computer and he had no idea what the computer is and how to use computer to help, you know, athletes. So he decided to race the net by like 15 centimeter. And that was like totally unscientific. It's, it's Mm -hmm. crazy. You know, it's crazy. It's like just, you know, using blood and sweat, you know, in, you know, instead of technology. And uh, that's where China was at in the 80s. So that needs to be portrayed. I mean, you know, splinters in the body and people just keep rolling. And uh, it could have been even worse than what you saw in the movie, you know, in the 80s. And you can't repeat the same thing, you know, after the victory with Japan in the 80s. You can't keep repeating the same thing in the second half. And Lang Ping, who's a real life character, and we did a lot of research with her. She was very much behind the movie. And she went to the U.S. She migrated to the U.S. in 1986. And then she, uh, you know, graduated in the U.S. And then she ended up uh, being coaches everywhere in Italy, you know, all over the, you know, he's, she speaks very good Italian because she worked in Italy for a few years. So she became a very international uh, sportsman. And um, she started learning about the different ways, not just the technology, but the mentality of sports mm-hmm. that, uh, uh, that has a much bigger scope than the way China was doing it in the 80s. And obviously, China is a very different country you know, today than it was in the 80s. Mm-hmm. So you cannot have the same rigorous training the way it was. And, um, and, and then certainly the kids today, you can't expect them to do the same thing that they did, you know, the 80s, the kids in the 80s do. So uh, what happened was then there's a certain sense of uh, more individualistic uh, quality to it. You know, people are, uh, you know, their pri- there are other priorities other than volleyball. They, have, they actually have an, the kids have an opinion. Like, actually, yeah, I don't want to do this. Yeah. <laughs> Back and, then, it wasn't, she didn't, they didn't have a choice. It was more of a filial or, you know, she wanted to do it for her family to, you know, bring things that were better for them instead of being farmers, I guess. But yeah. you're right. They have more of a choice. More have um, a choice. And they have so much more priorities. And at the same time, there's, there's a scene that was very important that we wanted to, 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 to the, you know, wanted the movie to, to, to show the audience is the fact that uh, in the eighties to be in the national team is like, the most important thing, the most important goal in their life. And, uh, but actually today there is a player who would actually say, I wanna quit. And that's completely incomprehensible, even for Long Ping, who's been coaches all over the world, who's been, the, who's been a US coach, you know, who should understand individualism a lot more than other Chinese people. But she still can't fathom the fact that there would be a player who's picked in the national team and who would want to quit and pursue her other dreams. Mm-hmm. So there's certainly an antithesis to, to the first half of the film on the second half that we wanted the audience to, to kind of get or understand that the times are changing. And uh, does it mean that uh, with this is more individualism, like Western individualism, versus Chinese collectivism. But I think it's not written, you know, it's so black and white. I I think there is still a certain collectivism in the team today, because first of all, volleyball is a collective sport and Chinese still is a very collective society to a certain extent. But there is a fork in the road and there is also a, a, a very different perspective on what is collectivism and what is individualism. I, I think there's both in the world well, today. I think it's that the, it, it's the, the example that I wanna bring up is that you know the, you brought up, I mean, it's a, it's a movie about in some ways, this woman who is basically f- fighting for her life and her family's life, it seems, right? And then later on, she stands in front of all of these men and she says, this is how we need to do this if we want to win. Mm-hmm. And she basically says, this isn't, there's no option. This is it. 
Mm. You know, I mean, she, to stand up in that time and be so strong, you know, when, when there's really no women um, in power, it, it's a pretty advanced way of uh, standing up for oneself, you know, and, and they went along with it. They yeah. said yes. And that's pretty incredible. You show her strength and, you know, you root for her as an audience member. I mean, obviously I'm a huge fan of Bong Lee's. I've seen probably every movie she's ever made. Um, and this was so different. This is something I've never seen her do before, you know? Um, and I, I, I thought that you shot her in a way that made her seem so statuesque as if she were a volleyball player. I mean, I know that she changed her posture and how she, you know, walked even, you know, her physical uh, being and how she inhabited this character. Um, I don't know, you know, that she's as tall as, as, as the other players, but how did you then have this walking shot of her with all these other players where I was like, is she on stilts? Like, what is Peter doing here? <laughs> tell, you know, tell me your secret. It was incredible. I, you know, it also just made her seem so muscular and, you know, just a very different frame that she was holding. I, I think the fact that she looks taller than she really is, is the fact that deep down inside she's tall. Mm. I think Gong Li is a very tough uh, character. I mean, I mean, the real Gong Li. I mean, she's, she is, I couldn't think of anyone else to play Lang Ping when I decided to make this movie. Uh, first of all, because of the perception of the audience, of the Chinese audience, or even the world audience of Gong Li, she's always been this very tough person. And uh, against all odds, she would defy any, you know, authority uh, to get what she wants. And, and I think that is very important. I think it's a presence. I think as long as she comes on set, you know, and put her in costume and just stand there, I think she has the presence and the command of Lang Ping. Uh, and also they have very, a lot of similarities. Lang Ping was Chinese, you know, sports name card to the world. You know, she was this character, this hero in the 90s, this woman hero. And Gong Li is the woman hero for the film industry or for the entertainment industry to the world. And they were both born in the 60s and they were, they were both the first batch that became recognized in the world in the 80s. So the two of them have a lot of similarities. And the only problem we have is the physical height. And um, the physical height, I mean, Gong Li it was, um, is 5'7", and Lang Ping is 6'1". So there's like a six inches difference. But I think the most important, I mean, definitely we, we did use some, you know, movie tricks, like sometimes, see the problem is, and Gong Li needs to stand next to all these present day athletes and they're not 6'1", they're like 6'5". So there is quite a big difference between Gong Li and some of the you know, present day players. So obviously we try to shoot medium shots. So sometimes we put her on Apple boxes. I mean, that's what we do in film. And there are probably a shot or two where there are long shots and we can't really hide the fact that they're all standing. And then we did use CGI to put, to make her uh -huh. a little bit longer, you know, to pick, make her a little bit taller. But other than that, you know, but she looked tall. Absolutely. I, mean, I, I think it's all from the inside. I think she looked tall from the inside. And um, I, I really couldn't imagine uh, what the film would be if I, could not get Gong Li to play the role because she was very hesitant. Was, she, was uh, she concerned about, what was she concerned she was, about? Just the, the, I mean, the character, the, the script, what, what was it that she was hesitant about? I'm curious. The most important thing was the fact that she need to play Lang Ping. And I think the Chinese, she thinks the Chinese audience would come to watch a movie with, uh, you know, with the microscopic, Kind of, you know, uh, criticism because Lang Ping is such a big national hero for four or five generations of Chinese. And um, it would be, it, it's too much of a 
pressure to play that character. Mm -hmm. I think that was her major concern. And I, I kept telling her that, uh, you know, you all you needed to be is just just to come on set and you'd be her, you know. Well, she she clearly felt safe with you and you were able to convince her to come on board. And and I mean, what a magnificent job that you both did. I mean, I could feel the warmth on the other side of the camera um, because even though she was tough and she was playing a tough character, there was such a suppleness and a vulnerability to her and the other, you know, athletes and actors in the movie that again, you know, if it were, if it were directed by a woman, I, I would have not been surprised. So you just brought such a wonderful light touch to this very brutal and very intense sport. So, you know, my hat is off to you. Um, I know that you were very detail oriented and even, you know, working with the designers and the team, which is so key. It's almost like an extension of your body and your mind. Um, and they brought over, you know, the actual flooring and the, the actual original pieces from that space in the 80s, um, what was your thought process behind it, you know, in terms of time and energy and effort? I, I think detail is, to me, detail is everything. You know, detail would um, make the movie so much more authentic, you know, and uh, like all kinds of details. When you do research, the real details are always better than what you make up. And uh, in this particular case, it's reenacting and bringing the 80s back so that everybody kind of like the audience would be able to travel back in time with you and feel that goosebump, you yeah. know, when they see stuff that are in the 80s. And I felt that goosebump when I went location scouting in Fujian in Southern China, in this famous volleyball training stadium that the women's volleyball have always trained, you know, they always, it's, it's, they call that place their lucky stadium because when, whenever they train there, they would end, they would end up getting, you know, the world champion um, almost every single time. So that was like a shrine, you know, in, mm -hmm. in, in Fujian. Uh, and uh, I went there location scouting one day and I, and I saw the place and I could totally see how the girls used to roll and sweat and get splinters on their body when, when they train in the 80s. And, and that was pure luck that we, the, the production designer realized that they were tearing it down. And he said, should we get the floorboards from them? And I said, of course. So we shipped all the floorboards from Southern China to Beijing uh, because we couldn't afford to go shoot in the Southern China because of our schedule. So we all shot in Beijing and uh, we, we found a, an old pharmaceutical, you know, abandoned factory and we transformed it into not just the stadium, but also the cafeteria, the dorms and the offices and uh, all the grounds, you know, of the, of the Fujian training facility. And when we put in the floorboards, um, to be very honest, could we make floorboards that would look like the old floorboards? Definitely. But I think the floorboards is something that would give everybody goosebumps when they walk into the set. And that would enhance the performance of every athlete that walked into the set and every crew members that, walk on, that work on the film. And, and, and I think that was almost like a, a thing that would uh, help the film to become more authentic and would put everybody on their toes, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, I, I, and I think it really worked. It's a story that I've, I've been telling to people over and over again. And I think those floorboards are very important to the film and to the spirit of the film, actually. It's, it's amazing, actually, as I hear you speak about it, it actually does make you, you know, understand that you're stepping on literally history. 
Exactly. And where sort of the birth of something very special, um, not just physically happened, but something emotional and something, you know, in some ways very spiritual happened with them. Um, and you know what? I, so you I, conjure this energy and this belief and this willpower to continue on training like that, you know? <laughs> you know what? I kept those floorboards in, in, you know, in the storage. And uh, I'm thinking of decorating my new office with those floorboards. That would be amazing. You know, maybe no splinters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe without the splinters. Um, well, I mean, obviously you have such an enthusiasm for, you know, for what you do and, and you love it so much. And that was, uh, it almost paralleled what was happening in the movie itself. Um, and there's so many people that, that loved the movie and had questions. And I wanted to ask you some. Um, Carmela asked, uh, what, what was the one important takeaway uh, that you hoped the audience would take from the movie once they saw it? What, what would you say was the one important thing or one of the important things? I, I hope that the audience could see the journey, you know, in the last 30 years in China, you know, because we always need to understand uh, how people become who they are, you know, and, and China has changed a great deal in the last 30, 40 years. And, and that, evolution of what is modern China today uh, all happened in from 1978, which is exactly, which coincided exactly with the history of the women's volleyball team. And to me, it's really not just about sports or volleyball. It's really about the growing and the changing of China in the last 30, mm -hmm. 40 years. And, uh, and to me, I'm actually, I mean, making this movie is like a lesson for me too to learn about the change, the change of, of China in the last 30, 40 years. So I, I think that is the reason I made the movie. And I, th I think that's the takeaway that the audience would probably get more than just a story or just a thrill or just the sports, you know, the excitement of the sports. It's, it's a lot more than that. That's, that's a wonderful answer. Um, so Angelique asked um, two questions. One is, who are your top three film inspirations? And also what qualities you look for in actors when you work with them or when you want to work with them? Uh, my first three film inspirations, that's a tough question. <laughs> I actually it's possible. I, I know. I'm glad I, I didn't ask that question. <laughs> yeah, I like a lot of things. You know, when they say my ten best movies, and I, I like a lot of stuff. But um, I think definitely, you know, I grew up watching, you know, a lot of American movies. I think American movies in the '70s. Mm -hmm movies that I, I mean, I, I would generalize it a lot more. I mean, American movies in the 70s where, again, it's almost like the theme of, of the volleyball movie. It's, it's a time of change and it's a time of, time of immense possibility. I mean, there are a lot of filmmakers uh, that grew up in the 70s that, that shaped my, my aesthetics and my, my knowledge of films and and uh and to to this day i i think those are still those movies are still my most important influence i understand and, that i think when you're when you're young and you're a child it yeah there's an impact and a a visual framework yes. that kind of is emblazoned into your system and it's always sort of a reference point or a touchstone so yes. that's, that's a beautiful way of putting it and then yes, the qualities uh, in, in the actors that you want to work with. I think, the qualities in the actors that I want to work with is their courage to go outside of their comfort zone. Mm. And, my way of getting my actors to 
go outside their comfort zone is to dig deep into their personal lives mm -hmm. and to tell scary. me stories. <laughs> Sorry? Scary. Scary. And to tell me stories of what really happened in their lives. And uh -huh. I've, I've, been, I've been credited with working with a lot of uh, uh, big name movie stars that had pretty different performances when they work with me. And, and there are no tricks. Uh, you know, because like I said, I don't know acting. I don't know how to tell them how to act. You know, I don't have big words and sermons or lessons or inspirations for them. All I can do is draw from their lives and try to dig deep into their inner self and then actually take those details as research and put it into the script mm -hmm. and make it the character. So in a way, they're not just acting, but they're re reenacting. Mm. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that often make their performance uh, more poignant and authentic. And, uh, and it's almost like voyeurism to a certain extent, because then the audience get to peek into the actor's personal lives. And that I mean, that has been my formula or mm -hmm. the way that has been working for me so far. That's beautiful. I think in some ways that's the intimacy of them becomes very apparent on film because it's part of them that's, you know, they're connecting to the character in a very personal way, even if they don't connect with the character. And that's, that's wonderful. The, um, the, I, mean, I, I like the word that you used, it, intimacy, is to bring about the intimacy between me and the actor. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, to try to put across and bring that intimacy uh, to the audience, you know, when, yeah. when it's on screen. And, and I, the audience could feel it. I mean, it, it's something that is very hard to explain, but I'm sure the audience could feel it. Mm. Well, I just have one final question from Sheenan, and then... Um... I'm going to let you off the hook, even though I could talk to you all night or all day where you are and all night where I am. Um, and what a pleasure it has been. Uh, I find you refreshing and just, I feel like I've known you for so long, even though we've just met on, on Zoom. And um, so Sheena wants to know what is the most important thing as an artist, for you as an artist um, in your life, in your career, what is the most important thing? You chose to be an artist, obviously. The most important thing for me is to share, again, is that intimacy, is to share my, my questions, you know, about lives. I mean, different stages of lives, you have different questions. And for me is to ask those questions and to share those questions in the process of making the movie. It's, it's almost like therapy for me. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever I have questions that I can't answer in my real life, I try to make a movie about it. <laughs> and, uh, and the movie, you know, you know, Chinese, you know, especially in Asia, we don't go to, you know, psychiatrists. It's, it's almost not kosher to go to right. a shrink, you know? So to me, making movies like going to a shrink, you know, I just ask those questions and post those questions and, work with my writers, my actors, and they become my therapists, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and in the process, again, I think the audience could feel it, you know, and uh, because I'm just a human being, you know, and the audience are human beings too, and we share the same questions. And when those questions are sometimes answered, most often not answered, mm -hmm. but when you're dealing with those questions, you kind of find a way to deal with life. That's wonderful. I, I think that um, you're allowing everyone to see that, you know, art, film, uh, those things can help you sort of not feel so alone and that you are part exactly. of something and sh you share something uh, you can relate to or not relate to other characters and feel that you are part of a family outside of your own, let's say, genetic family. And that's how I found my own art too, that I connected in a way and was able to express myself in a way that was not maybe how I was in my own family. Um, but Peter, you know, I, 
sorry. You, see, you 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 just put you just put it in one word and and much better than the way I I, I said it a while ago. <laughs> it's connection. Yeah. It's connection. And then when you're in the cinema, you feel that you're connected with the audience and you're connected with the filmmakers. And as a filmmaker, I see that I'm connected with the audience. The audience feels that they're connected with me, that you're not alone. It's it's all about connection because there are filmmakers who make dreams, you know, like mm. we as a dream factory. Yeah. So it's all about dreams. You know, it's all about the fascination of, of what could happen. But there are certain filmmakers that are not about dreams, but they're all about connection. It's about you know, feeling like you're not alone in the world. That's that's ex- precisely what I what I what I meant a while ago. Well, speaking of dreams, I do feel like this movie uh, is about dreams and about dreams coming true and about connection and family outside your own family. And there's a sense of unity there that I can appreciate. And I think you know that when you work on a film set or you know on on something that's either long or short there is a, a, it's like an explosion of energy between all of the crew and, and the actors. And it's something that can't be recreated. And you were able to do that and capture that in this film and, you know, bring it to audiences everywhere. So uh, congratulations. And I hope that at some point we will be able to meet in person. Thank you. Um, I can't believe we've never met. I know. And yeah. by the way, Xing Yan Kuai Luo. Um, the year of the metal ox we have a lot to look forward to and um we will meet and let's 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 hope it's not when there's another 12 cycle of animals (laughs) (laughs) thank you